Hi folks, welcome to Bear Mountain today. We are making our own fertilizer for next season's flowers. So stay tuned and we'll show you how we're gonna do it. Okay, what we're making today is called JLF or Jadam Liquid Fertilizer. Jadam is a system that Master Cho's son, Young Sang Cho, developed for ultra low cost organic farming. But there are some techniques that you know anybody can apply, even in a home garden, that would give extra fertilizer uh, boost to your plants, and that's called the JLF or Jadam Liquid Fertilizer. So the process is really simple. Um, we're going to use five gallon pails. Now, if you had a 10 gallon pail or an eight gallon pail or a four gallon pail, you know, it, it's all good. The size of the container just means you either put more or less material into it. But the process is essentially the same. It's very simple. We're going to take our crop residues, our flower residues, we're going to, that we do from deadheading or removing plants, we're going to chop them up and uh, put it into the bucket about halfway up. Then the rest of it gets filled with water all the way to the top. Uh, you put in a hand of what he calls handful of leaf mold soil, which is actually the soil, uh, the definition that he's using is the soil that is just below the leaf mold underneath like deciduous trees. Um, it's just in that top inch or so. Or if you don't have access to it, he uh, kind of put a little clue in the book that if you, if you piled up grass like hay or uh, stuff that was still green and you continue to water it for a while, the soil underneath would become just like leaf mold soil. Well, if you kind of carry that to an extreme, if you had a compost pile like we've had, our compost is very slow um, process, takes many months. I, I captured this soil right at the interface between the compost pile and the ground it was sitting on. So this is full of biology. I checked underneath uh, our microscope and we've got all kinds of things in here uh, from uh, fungi to uh, acti actinomycetes, all kinds of biology in here isn't good. Well, this is what is inoculating the fertilizer itself. Now you may say, hmm, you're putting organic material in a pail. You're putting some biology in there and you're filling it with full of water and then you're gonna shut it and you're gonna leave it for many months. And that's an anaerobic process, isn't it? And the answer is yes, it is. It's very anaerobic. And the reason why um, we're doing this is what we're trying to do is capture all of the nutrients that are in the materials. When you compost, typically what uh, happens in a composting process that's exposed to the atmosphere is you're going to have a reduction in size but there's going to be a lot of carbon and there's going to be a lot of, of um, uh, other compounds that are going to off gas uh, as that pile uh, progresses to being finished. These materials are all going to stay inside of a closed container. Um, it's not going to get explosive because it's underwater. Uh, any of the gases will be just reabsorbed mostly back into the material itself. But when you do open it up, if you open it up early, you're going to be surprised at how bad it smells. However, the longer you let it go when the fermentation process is finished, there still may be somewhat of an odor, but it's going to be significantly less. And particularly as you apply this fertilizer, it's applied in a very, very dilute concentration. We're talking um, 30, 30 parts water, one part fertilizer to most of the time it's one part fertilizer to 100 parts water. So it becomes a very dilute solution and when exposed to the atmosphere and applied to the plants, uh, either as a soil drench or in some cases a foliar feed, it becomes very odorless. Where are you going to put the bucket while it does this? See, that's the thing is the beauty of this. There is no real special place you need to put it. You just need to keep it away from freezing. So like uh, till we start getting into the low, low days of fall and we start getting freezing weather at night, uh, we're just going to keep it outside. And uh, In the shade? In the shade. We just got like a tree that's nearby to where the flowers are. If you're in a more temperate climate, you know, that doesn't really freeze at all and you have a really secure pot that you can do this in, you could just leave it outside permanently. 
Is this a type of thing, uh, activity that you should do this time of year is kind of a preparation for next year? Yeah. Kind of like canning and freezing yeah. and preserving food? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a timely... Mr. Mr. Cho, Young San Cho says, the longer y you leave this material to mature, it's like soy sauce. The older it ages, the better it gets. The better it gets. So... The best of worlds is is you're you're making the fertilizer you know the year before you're going to be using it. So it's just like a preparation that you do yeah. at a certain time. But it doesn't have to be done during fall. So as an example, if you're if you're capturing other things, you can make um, um, JLF out of uh, cut grass in the spring, and you do the same process, and you so would then leave it, would it take until a, the next spring to be the used. next spring. Okay. So you can do this all year long. There is no particular reason why you, you have to stop. It's usually other than there isn't any organic material to put into it, okay. which I mean, dead of winter, I guess that would be true. Okay. So now some of the questions people might have is, is like, okay, well, how can I cut the odor down? I mean, if I, I don't want to smell this. Well, if the lid's on, you're not going to smell it. Okay, the lid's got to be tight. Does the lid need to be... Um one of those gamma sealed ones? A gamma seal lid would work, or in this case, we're just using an old cheap lid with a uh, rubber ring inside uh, that you get off like a paint bucket or something like that, you know, that's cleaned or a food grade bucket. Uh, that sort of lid also works. The key to it is that what you're trying to do is create a seal. Uh, you want to keep the moisture in. You don't want the um, critters to get into it. Uh, mostly, once it starts to stink, they won't. Um, <laughs> you don't want flies around it. Well, flies don't hurt, but it's just a, more of an unsightly thing. It really wouldn't be bad if you know flies got in it and laid eggs in it because they'll do their thing and they'll leave. Uh, when the when they're done, they'll just become part of the process. But you know, people don't want that kind of around, so you don't want to smell it. You don't want to see it. There are some techniques you can do to reduce it. So what is the benefits of this when we do put it on in the spring? Uh, it'll be a fertilizer that we didn't have to purchase. Okay, what kind of uh, minerals and stuff will they be, will it be uh, um, adding? Well, the beauty of this is, is that what we're doing is we're using the minerals that are now captured. The plant knows what minerals it wants and tries to get as many of those as it can. It's just by the very nature of its plant. So if you use, say, like um, uh, a fertilizer made out of zinnias to fertilize zinnias, you're it, going to it knows help the zinnias. They already know and they pulled up what they needed. I guess that's a way of looking at it. If you can kind of look at it from a, uh, a way of a healthy plant knows and gets what it needs from the soil itself and gets those things. So if you can give them a boost with those things that it used last year, it's like paying it forward in a sense in a year, the next year on. But the zinnias that we're going to show don't look healthy. It doesn't really matter if it's totally healthy or not. For the most part, okay, any diseases that are on those things or anything, you know, foliar diseases, whatever, the, the acidic environment of the process of anaerobic um, fermentation on it is going to kill those things off. They're going to be gone. But what is going to be left is going to be the nutrients that are left that um, the bacteria didn't consume, the minerals, the, the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium, and those things are all gonna be in the balance that the plant needed in general. If you're looking at it and you're saying, if I'm using totally slimed out plants, you wouldn't probably do that. It's not gonna add a whole lot. But if you're putting in plants that are reasonable health, and maybe they're just near the end of their time and they're starting to senesce, that's perfectly acceptable, or even a diseased you know, slightly diseased like a tomato, if you're making a tomato JLF and you use something that have butt rot on it or something like that, you know, where the bottom blossom and rot of the tomato is. Uh, unsightly to eat, but it makes a fine fertilizer out of it because the majority of those things are already in that fruit, okay? Um, so it's not that bad that if you use some things that are, that are damaged, that are unsightly, that you wouldn't sell or, or consume yourself or something like that. It doesn't hurt it at all. The whole thing is, uh, what we're trying to do is, is introduce um, the minerals and the things that the plant captured while it was growing back to the next generation when it grows. So one of the things that people ask is, okay, if I make this stuff and it stinks and I open it up three months later, you can technically use it usually after about three months. 
In some cases, depending on, on the, the material, it could be as little as three or four weeks. But again, the longer you let it age, the more the things begin to settle down and um, the smell begins to dissipate a bit. The way you can do to help mitigate that is you can, from the very beginning when you make it, add in uh, what he calls a phyllite, which is a rock mineral. That's a little different. We don't have access to that here, but we have access to azomite. Azomite is a seabed-based mineral rock that it's kind of a, in the same class as a phyllite, but it's not exactly the same, but it has a huge amount of minerals in it. Um, we also use biochar in it. Um, what we're talking about is when we make it and, and we'll put down some green material, we'll sprinkle a little bit of these guys on it, a little bit of the, of the, uh, the bacterial or, or the inoculant soil on it, and just keep doing that layer by layer until we're a little more than about half to two thirds full and it's pressed down very nicely. These two things here will help suppress odors. So when you do get to the point when you're a year later and you open it up, it's not so bad. And I did a earlier JLF out of vegetable wastes, mostly uh, tomato and cucumber and um, some summer squash, things like that nature. And I've been going for about two and a half months and I opened it up just to check on it. It did have an odor on it, but um, once I closed it back up, the odor was gone. So it wasn't that bad. It wasn't like knock you on your you know what and it just hangs around forever. It doesn't do that. So let's get on to making it. Uh, what we're gonna do is capture our waste and start uh, putting it in the bucket itself. Okay, here's an example of what we're gonna put into the uh, flower JLF. We have zinnias that were uh, damaged by uh, weather and uh, we had wildfires here, so we had a lot of ash on them that kind of created problems with the blooms. And then we had a windstorm that came through and knocked our marigolds around and we lost a bunch of that. So we're just gonna take these things and put them in the bucket. So I'm just going to, you know, kind of accelerate the process a little bit and see if I can get more in the bucket by just kind of clipping these things up. But, you know, depending on the size of your container, there's no reason they got to be, you know, super fine or shredded or anything of that nature. I'm just doing this basically so I can get a lot more in the bucket. Because the idea is what I want to do is I want to get it, you know, packed pretty full, but still enough uh, room around the material that water can get around it. It's not like I'm trying to make a, uh, you're not trying to pack it down so tight that, that water can't, the water can't get around it. You want the water to be around the material. So let me just. Is this gonna, are this solution gonna be only for zinnias and marigolds or can it be used for other things It can too? be used for flowers in general, you know, but if you really wanna be super specific and say you're a big zinnia farmer, right? And that's what you raise is zinnias. And yeah, you'd want to, you know, um, probably use a specific Zinnia JLF. Or if you're a rose farmer and you only grow roses, you'd probably want to use, you know, that that's specific to that. This one is in a general good um, case, you know, for us. It's like um, what we're trying to do is capture, in general, things that are growing around the same time. Um, that there'll be slightly different needs, but it'll be a kind of a more of a balanced approach instead of just a specific. So the first thing I did is I put in, I put in a layer down at the bottom, got it chopped there. I'm gonna put a little bit of that soil, just as an inoculant. This is not scientific, just a little bit of biochar. A little bit of the rock powder, azomite, not a ton. So the whole point, what we're trying to do is just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. So now we're putting some more zinnias. You know, if you don't have clippers, you can just get really aggressive and just, you know, rip these things apart. And it doesn't matter if there's a bug inside of the flower or anything like that, who cares? You know, just, just don't put the bees in. Well, no, the bees, hopefully they're smart enough to get out of it. So these are all things we deadheaded earlier. 
and we're just going to keep, you know, building it up. So this is going to be a Zinnia Marigold mix. These guys are a little tougher, so I can't really get away with doing that. Stems in these marigolds are quite beefy this year. Just late. Yeah, they were late. Right when they were getting to be perfect, the wildfire smoke caused them to be severely delayed. So the whole key is we just keep going like that, you know, just a little bit more. A little bit more. Excuse me, didn't mean to bump the camera. A little bit more rock powder. All right, we got it uh, halfway full, maybe a little more, uh, but that's okay. It's approximately half full. We're gonna put our last scoop of uh, inoculant soil in, a little more biochar at the top, and a little bit more azomite. Is this our biochar? No. This, this was biochar that was purchased from uh, Concentrates in Portland, Oregon. And it's made by a company called Black Owl Biochar up in Washington. And um, the nice thing about it is it's, it's already um, ground, so it's nice and fine. You could use your own biochar. We didn't in this case. We cheated. Um, <laughs> But, but that's yeah, if part you of to it. Use your, own, your, use your own biochar. That's the only thing is really you really um, probably end up purchasing, and these aren't very expensive, is a rock dust powder. I mean, you're talking about like you can get 50 pound bags of stuff uh, at least here on the West Coast uh, for uh, 15 to 20 dollars in a bag, and if you're making uh, JLF with a 50 pound bag of rock dust as you saw how much I used uh, you could make a lot of JLF and again when you're putting it on the the soil or, or applying it to the plants you're diluting it pretty heavily like a you know 100, 100 parts of water to one part of uh, the liquid fertilizer so we got everything in it the next step is uh, we're just gonna fill this guy to the top with uh, water what it does is it kind of washes everything down around, you know, what we put in. And we're going to fill this guy all the way to right about here, just below where the lid will snap on. And again, the reason we want it, we're going to be using a, a snap-on lid with a seal is that uh, we want to make certain that the liquid doesn't evaporate and then it continues to work in an anaerobic. There's a bug trying to crawl out. Yeah, well, you know, it needs <laughs> to be part of the mix. <laughs> Sorry. You're a fertilizer, dude. I think it was an earwig? Yep. The earwigs have been kind of bad in the last week on our marigolds, huh? Yes. For some reason, they just seem to like really go crazy. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of push it down a little bit so I know where the water level is. Okay, it looks like I'm right about there. There, Mr. Earwig. Okay, um, as you can see, that the material will float to the top and that's okay, don't worry about it. It's escaping. Um, there isn't anything more to do with it at this point. You could just put a little more, just for safety case, <laughs> on top. And at this point, the, the next thing to do is uh, just make sure there's nothing sticking on it's going to keep the lid from sealing. Put your lid on. And that's it for actually making it. Now, you got a bucket of this stuff, and you got three buckets of this stuff, and you go, uh, a month later, I don't know. They're all orange, and they all have a top on them. And they all look the same inside. And they all look the same inside. <laughs> so uh, how do you tell which is which? Okay. <clears throat> One of the things about this is once you make this stuff, you're probably not going to use this bucket for anything but making this stuff again. 
So just assume that what you bought here or what you have is your JLF making equipment. Uh, and the reason behind it is, is because that plastic will absorb some of those odors and no matter how much you scrub or put bleach in it or do whatever it is that, that you need to do, you, you don't really need to clean it out anyway. When this material gets finished decomposing, you're going to end up with a residue down at the bottom that's going to be a fraction of what we put in. We're going to be talking about something down at the bottom that's maybe an inch of residue. As it's finished, it will drop down and it will finish. Basically, it will become in, you know, indistinguishable, just a, a base down at the bottom. It's kind of like the same thing you'd find at the bottom of a pond. It's very anaerobic. It's uh, probably uh, contains some acids and things of that nature, but that's not that big of a deal. So you, what you would do is, as you use the fertilizer up, um, you know, you don't want to leave the lid open. So you only want to open the lid long enough to take out what you need and then put the lid back on. And then what you can do uh, is you can simply add more material to it and more water go through the process again. Once you've, you've taken the fertilizer down to this level and there's the only thing that's left down there is the residue down at the bottom, go back through the process again. Take your materials, chop them up, put them in there, put in the inoculant, all that kind of stuff, put more water in it, start it over. So it doesn't have to be a clean bucket to nope. start over. You, you don't have to clean that, that out until you get to a point where it's like, hey, wait a minute, that residue is taking way too much of the space. Okay. okay, then what I would do with it at that point is I would take it out and I would put it into an aerobic compost pile that was that was working away and just let the uh, natural processes, you know, finish it off. Now, some people would say, well, you know, if you dilute it enough, you could maybe put it around perennial plants or something. Um, I don't know. I think the jury's out on that. My mind, I think, you know, taking that last residue and just letting it go through a, a bigger process of fermentation probably is good enough to, you know, straighten out anything that might be in it. If, if there's a concern that there's something in it that's bad. Okay, so now you got these buckets and they look kind of all the same. Um, what I use as a way of knowing what's in this is I'm going to label it two ways. And with a permanent marker, okay. I'm going to write on the lid J L F and I'm going to put a number in this case we are um, this is our th number three and I'm going to leave that three on there and I'm going to put it also on here too if I can write upside down <laughs> how do I do that <laughs> <laughs> F and then three. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, I'm keeping a master list of, of this at this time, what's in my JLF3 bucket. Okay, and I got a JLF2 bucket and JLF1, etc. You see the pattern. Um, this won't come off, so, um, but I didn't specifically say what's in it because it's, it could possibly change. Next year, I may make this out of all rose clippings, or um, maybe I'm using alstomeria, or maybe it's not even a flower and it ends up being, you know. Sunflowers. Uh, sunflowers or, or veg or something. You beans. Know? Um, and so that's what, this allows it kind of some flexibility to, to change it out. It doesn't always have to be the same stuff, but it has to be the same process. The other thing you can do is saying, well, wait a minute. I don't want to permanently mark up my bucket, but as we talked about before, this is end up going to be a permanent bucket. You could use tape and then just write on the tape and then just peel the tape off when you're done with it. Problem with tape is when you write on it, um, this is going to take a year to go. And it might and the chances be are fade. pretty good it's going to be gone by then. Yeah. So you got to use it kind of with judgment. Now for now, what we're going to do is we have about another month and a half of frost free weather. Uh, we're going to put this up by uh, right by where we harvested the material that went in here. Uh, we've got a maple tree we're going to stick it by. And um, we'll come back out and get it uh, before the weather turns starts turning frosty at night. And then we'll store it uh, probably in our greenhouse where it doesn't freeze. And just keep it from freezing. Oh, so it's going to be in my greenhouse potential for... Just stacked up in a corner. Okay. Yep. It's not going to no do smell. anything. No smell. 
It's not going to do anything. There won't be any smell. Um, it's sealed tight. Animals aren't going to get into it okay. other than the two legged type. You know, if you got kids that, you know, neighborhood kids or something, but I digress. Mostly nobody's going to bother this. And the whole thing is this will be ready next summer when we plant our zinnias and our marigolds and we'll use it again. So do you, when you get ready to use it next summer, will it be for new seedlings or will it be for more established plants? The key to using this is you can use it on new seedlings. It's just the concentration level that you'll go at. Um, always start from, a, from a, a concentration that's low to high, meaning I would start uh, with like a 1 to 100 dilution and if you don't notice any impact or any positive impact or negative impact or anything of that nature then maybe move the dilution to 1 to 75 okay and if that seems like that's giving you the response then great stay there if you need to move it up again uh, you'll notice a response just what like you is would regular the fertilizer. response what would the you would start to see stronger growth just like you would see the same response greener, for like a commercial fertilizer plants would green up plants will green up plants will start growing um they look good they don't you know if you're putting it on way too heavy like you start out at one to thirty uh you're going to end up with you know you possibly on a delicate uh flower you might end up with a situation where you know you get a fertilizer burn so you got to remember this stuff's going to be really concentrated and so this is going to make ultimately in the end in this five gallon bucket pretty close to about four gallons of JLF. And if you start doing the dilution ratio on that and say, let's I, I'll move it all at one to 100, I've just made 400 gallons of liquid fertilizer. Okay, so that uh, should last you quite a bit. I recommend, if you guys want to find out more about this, check out, uh, you can get it on Amazon. We'll put it through our store. Um, Young Shen, uh, Young Sang Cho's book. Um, he uh, he's got an organization in Korea, and that it is um, he he works on um, donations. So he's not he's not out there trying to you know make money on patented things and things of that nature. And he's out there to help individual growers and farmers do things in an economical way where where they can empower themselves to take care of their own place. So it's, it's really, I found it a really good read and I'd recommend getting it. And that's kind of where we got the idea for this. I'm sure there's a lot of other videos out there on the internet. They'll talk, you know, different aspects of it and that's all good. I just kind of wanted to show you guys what we're trying to do to integrate this into our K and F practices. We're not experts. Not at all. This is just another case of us trying something and right. learning from it. But it makes total sense from a standpoint and this will be more applied as a soil fertilizer than a foliar feed. The K and F solutions are more of a foliar feed. So then if you sprayed it on your flowers, would they smell? No, they wouldn't smell, but um, might you, damage them. Um, yeah, you wouldn't want to do this um, because probably it'll cause spotting. Right. Um, now you can get away with that with some of the other things that, that uh, Mr. Cho has developed. He's developed a, uh, a wetting agent that you can, it's basically insecticidal soap that you can make at home. Uh, it's really kind of a fascinating process. Will this, do you think, help deter bugs? Um, Cucumber plants beetles. always deter, I think, a healthy plant and a healthy growing system are always a deterrent for bugs. But as you're saying, is it an insecticide? No, mm. not really. No, this is a fertilizer. This is applying minerals and nutrients. Okay, so thanks for watching today, folks, and um, hope you find this kind of interesting, and uh, be sure to check out the book, like I said, and uh, we want to hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.